Okay, I guess it's time we can start now. More people logging in. Um, good morning, um, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is ready for the holiday season. <laughs> Busy time of the year. Um, today I'm, I'm um, hosting again and then with Carrie Mitchell from Purdue. Um, uh, welcome to the cafe, Indoor Ag Science Cafe. So, um, just a quick reminder, um, I think everyone learned the trick um, by now, but um, uh, please mute um, your microphone, particularly when presenter is um, speaking. Um, you know, sometimes, particularly um, like the phone people, um, calling people, um, uh, unexpectedly uh, transmitting noise, surrounding noise. Last time we could hear the office, you know, conversation behind the um, presentation. So it, it's not really um, uh, ideal. So um, please make sure you mute using the icon lower left uh, of your um, uh, Zoom um, window. Um, I can do that from here, and then particularly for phone, um, uh, I think once I do, you can't reverse. Um, so, so I try not to do it as much as possible. But if you get muted by me, and then you wanted to speak up, then please let me know. Um, chat area is useful to, to request, um, and then I can um, unmute again. So anyway, um, today, um, we have again uh, two parts. One is a presentation um, and information exchange, and then the second part is an open discussion or you know announcement and things like that. So today's topical presenters are from uh, Green Spirit Farms, um, Mylan Kluko and Dan Kluko, um, uh, son and uh, father and son, um, and I think. You guys are the one of the oldest vertical farms in the U.S., correct? Uh, yeah, I started planting, I think, in 2011, but the first harvest wasn't until early uh, 2012. Yeah, so um, looking forward to listen to their stories, um, our stories, Green Spirit Farms to um, Harvest Moon Farms. So I am stopping share now. And then, um, Mylan, you can share from the green okay. icon in your center at the bottom. Okay, so when I press share, then I am going to select the screen. So I share. Yep, it's coming. And then launch your PowerPoint. Lower, yep. Okay. And it should be. Select that yeah, file. See if that works. And then and presentation mode. Slide, right? So slideshow. Yep, yep. From the beginning. Right. There you go. All right. So um, some people, uh, I didn't say hi to Carrie. Hi, Carrie. We haven't talked hey. in a while. Uh, uh, some people know uh, us as Green Spirit Farms. And uh, we recently sort of had a, uh, I'll just call it a reorganization. Um, with a new group that was an organic farm uh, initially. They started in 2007 uh, doing organic farming and uh, sort of threw in the towel in 2015. Uh, the drought of 2012 sort of hurt them. They had some other weather events, but they were, um, they were in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Uh, they contacted us probably right around 2015 and 16 to see if we could somehow um, work in their aggregation program they were working with a bunch of other uh, regional uh, farmers in that part of southwestern Wisconsin and it just didn't come together uh, for us and um, but we were approached by doing an opportunity in Puerto Rico uh, by them they had been out of the vertical they had been out of the soil organic soil farming business since uh, 2015 and a couple of months of discussion and uh, lo and behold, now we're uh, going to be uh, marketing our products and doing different things with uh, Harvest Moon Farms. So that's sort of the short version of uh, several months of conversation. And then with that said, I'll just sort of get into the presentation. So, you know, my opinion had always been to try to uh, bring a, a more secure and cost-effective approach to grow vegetables. We started 
doing this, you know, back in 2011 when I uh, doing most of this work with uh, my engineering company. So my opinion is on the screen that we can do this um, in or near urban areas. Uh, I'm not greenhouse based, although I worked with a company many of you may have heard of, Archer Daniels Midland in Decatur, and did hydroponic lettuce with them back in the late 90s. Uh, and it was actually a um, uh, it was a uh, aquaponics operation and uh, it was a large scale greenhouse. And so I learned learned from that experience and sort of adapted what we're doing now as everybody else has. Uh, better way to grow, how to grow, and everyone, I applaud everybody for taking the plunge in the vertical farm. Um, but I look at vertical farming as a component of the agriculture supply chain. And it's interesting that the soil farmer uh, sees vertical farming as a more consistent part of that. So obviously some of, the, some of you folks might have, uh, are already doing this, but um, we're closer to the market. We're just outside of Chicago. We're 65 miles from downtown Chicago. So we're, um, we're basically in the market or at the market. Um, I like to use the term, we're vertical farm to table. Uh, relatively reliable because every week we put stuff into the marketplace and um, no pesticides or herbicides. Um, most of our stuff goes out the same day it's harvested with the exception of uh, maybe the Whole Foods um, customers that we service um, because of a certain slot time that we have to have with Whole Foods. Uh, we've been put in the cooler overnight and then deliver first thing the next morning. So that vertical farming provides us sort of those, that type of flexibility. Um, but again, we do mostly direct store delivery. We do deal with a few broadliners now that Harvest Moon Farms uh, brought in, um, as well as distribution centers. Um, and at the end of the day, um, our quality is better. Uh, there's less handling throughout the supply chain because typically they're either sending trucks here to pick stuff up at our farm because we're off of Interstate 94, we're exit one uh, going across Michigan. So uh, their trucks are running uh, basically back and forth on the interstate. So this, they find it very easy to come to us and pick up the material. And clearly the advantage is that we use a lot less, there's a lot less waste um, in what we're doing. Uh, clearly we use a lot less water and you know, we do it in a lot less space. So I give Dick a lot of credit because you know, his concept is what sort of stimulated a lot of us to sort of look at different things. And, um, and Dixon, I don't know how many you know this, but we had a midwinter harvest festival back in 2015 in February. And we, and we had several of the restaurants that we supplied uh, produce to um, have, uh, make dishes with all of our stuff again in the, in, at the end of February. And Dick came out and spoke and it was uh, very well received. But I give uh, Dick credit for sort of coalescing, you know, a movement. And there are different ways to do um, sort of uh, this type of CEA. And um, most of us are familiar with these uh, general types. Um, and these are sort of, um, you know, people are using different things, whether you're greenhouse or whether you're um, doing vertical farming, everybody has a uh, technique. And, uh, you know, we use a, uh, you know, a sort of a uh, flow cord system, shallow water. We grow in one inch of water. And the changes that we made to our systems over the year or connect a single system with a single tank, as you see on the, the left-hand side of the image, uh, to basically bring it to a single nutrient tank, tank and connect six or eight uh, growing systems. And uh, we do cut and come again, as well as one and done. So what you're looking at there on the left-hand side is basically basil, uh, and on the right-hand side are just the lettuces. And then as you go through the farm, um, again, we have uh, just a series of uh, tanks that feed um, the multiple vertical growing systems, as we call them. So we started, we were using individual grow tanks, like you see on the left, and we eliminated those, eliminate a lot of labor for checking them, allowed for automation that was already, you know, in the marketplace. Um, and we have some other things that we do with, um, you know, harvesting and added some semi-automation to lettuce harvesting. But mostly the basil, the kale, and arugula are still done, uh, cut and come again, and still done, you know, by hand. Um, and so what we do is we grow, uh, we grow our, our lettuces, we monocrop uh, those six units and it takes up about 550 square feet. That includes the rows on either side of it. Uh, we do a gourmet mix. We're starting to do some head lettuces from the, for the broad liners, but mostly the uh, self-contained platform, uh, you know, for our harvest, we do about uh, 90, about, well, 9,144 lettuce plants, and those are four different varieties of lettuces. 
um, and they're put into a gourmet mix. Um, that's our yield. Uh, it's a, you know, per harvest, uh, that's what we get. And then basically just some quick revenue you know, in our market of what we get based on. This is a single unit. So we have seven of these units uh, growing lettuce here. Uh, we converted our Detroit uh, operation, which is operating under a license agreement, to all basil. Uh, and they grow now about 200 pounds a week of basil. And that's primarily sold into the uh, Detroit market. And that's all sold as leaf only, by the way, which is what we sort of uh, how we sell our basil. So uh, we have a little bit less basil here, more kale, more cotton come again, except for lettuce. And we'll add more head lettuces because of the relationship now that we have with Harvest Moon Farms. So we grow in the MVGS, uh, we grow kale of different uh, maturity because it's based on nutrient delivery and uh, spinaches and shard. Uh, my son, Dan, who hasn't shown up, up yet for this, by the way, Jerry, but um, <laughs> uh, he, uh, he's, uh, he's basically doing some rooting vegetables as well as strawberries. So he's doing radishes and beets. So that's sort of his focus as well as uh, strawberries. And uh, we've grown some other herbs. We're going to be growing more herbs right now for a food preparation company, sort of like a, um, a blue apron uh, that, again, that Harvest Moon Farms, you know, brought to us. And then basically, historically, we have grown stevia. Uh, the large beverage company is Coca-Cola. So when they were looking at doing their um, Coca-Cola Life product, uh, we test grew stevia for them for almost two years. Um, and uh, we're growing stevia now for another company to look at growing that commercially and how to process it. So, um, you know, really what we try tried to focus on is reducing labor and losing energy. And those are our statistics uh, with going to the single dosing system, you know, we reduced a lot of the labor because of those individual tanks that were kind of obvious. Uh, with the advent of switching from the induction lamp, lamps that we started with in 2011 to uh, the LEDs, uh, we decreased our energy usage uh, quite a bit, as you can see there, by about 62%. And our yields, uh, once we dialed everything in, uh, increased by about 30% over what we started. Um, so, and then this is sort of my canned light, this is sort of, or canned slide. Um, on what, what we're looking at and how we um, did some things. I'm sure everybody has a version of this um, graph, but we're uh, basically in the, um, you know, that six, uh, 640 to 680 range growing things. And um, this is just some history on what we did for those people who don't know who we were. Uh, you know, again, our commercial growing really started in uh, 2012. Uh, I don't know how many people know this, but we were asked by Coca-Cola to come over and uh, put up a demonstration farm. Unfortunately, uh, in a city of 7 million that was getting about 5 million visitors, it was kind of difficult getting around town and finding an empty warehouse, uh, but we were able to do it. And uh, we did, um, we set up uh, a limited farm, but it was a, it was a vertical farm. It just happened to be a little bit more horizontal than we liked it just because of space. But um, we, were, we participated in a sustainable agricultural summit, and they invited um, this particular summit invited people from all over the world to look at vertical farming. And uh, we then had to move the farm from where we were growing to where the event was held at the end of the Olympic Games, which is at the Royal Institute of British Architecture. And we couldn't fit everything in the room, so we only had five or six uh, units, but we had to do everything at night. We had to actually literally move the farm. So we moved the farm from Hammersmith to uh, downtown London, reassembled it without a lot of uh, damage. Uh, in 2013, uh, at the advent of after the Summer Olympic Games, we uh, started growing stuff for a company that was newly formed called Life Kitchens. They have, I don't know, probably 20 locations across the United States now. Their first Chicago location we uh, grew, worked with their chefs to grow uh, what they were uh, starting with on their menu, five menu items. And then uh, we had a, a long-term, what I call a demonstration farm uh, outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania for, uh, from May until March of 2014. It was in the old Owens Corning uh, fiber optics building. It was, there were clean rooms. And we started there as a, as a view towards the New York market. Um, the funding on that didn't come together. So we just took some of that material and uh, came back home. Um, 2013, we started looking at, you know, the rainbow shards, the bok choy, that's when we first started growing radishes, beets, and we do grow, um, we're growing more now uh, carrots, and um, kind of interesting uh, in looking at how to grow those carrots and the type of carrots that we're, um, that we're growing. 
Uh, in 2014, we uh, signed an, um, a license agreement with Artesian Farms in Detroit, and that first planting was done in 2015, and uh, they've been growing uh, ever since. We also got them approved as a, a whole food vendor, and uh, like I said, right now, because of uh, a large basil uh, demand and a contract for basil, uh, they're providing uh, 200 pounds a week in a space that's probably 6,000 square feet total. Um, and um, and that, that's their focus. We then bid with a, um, a company that was bidding on the Midway Airport Modernization Program in 2016, and this team was selected, and the, 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 the overall customer was S or the clients SSP America. They're out of uh, McLean, Virginia, but they're out of the UK. And uh, they're actually expanding the food court, and we're looking at adding uh, supply to them probably sometime um, in the next quarter, but they've expanded the food court Lettuce is a big demand there, kale, uh, arugula, and then some mixed greens that we're looking on uh, adding. That includes both arugula, kale, and uh, lettuce. A little bit on who Harvest Moon Sustainable Ventures are, or Harvest Moon Farms. Uh, they started in 2007 as an organic farm in southwestern Michigan. Uh, after doing that for a couple of years, they decided to kind of uh, redefine or define their crops for their regional market, which was basically sort of Milwaukee, more or less, Madison, Milwaukee, and a little bit in Chicago. Um, in 2010, they kind of, kind of went from a CSA uh, model, uh, and they did a lot of farmer's markets to doing direct wholesale supply. They got some of the broadliners to come uh, pick up their stuff. And then 2012 happened for them. Uh, it was a bad drought in the Midwest, I think, across the country. Uh, and they really, um, really suffered uh, a lot that year and the following year. Um, that's when they started looking at trying to do aggregation with the other nearby farms. So they put together a business model to um, uh, aggregate going forward in the years that they operated, three years they operated after that, to have a continued supply. And they sort of were the lead into the marketplace. And they started dealing with companies like Cold Foods, Mariano's, and more into the Chicago uh, market. Again, not prepackaged, mostly all just um, um, food service or bunched vegetables. And then they just uh, never really recovered from 2015. Uh, they approached us in 16 to try to see how we could supplement their stuff. Um, and uh, we just really never got together until the uh, Puerto Rico opportunity came together, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but they made the decision in 2015 not to plant. And um, they've been analyzing different vertical farming methods since then. And we finally got together based on um, you know, just months of talking, and uh, now we're going to be uh, Harvest Moon Farms. So this is a graphic that actually shows that when we started growing, we were using the induction lamp uh, lighting and full spectrum light, and we used to, based on the spread of the light and DLI, we were using a four-level system. Uh, we then switched that as we went to LED lighting, and uh, basically went to a six-level system that's 16 feet high. Um, you know, uh, basically six trays uh, all connected uh, together. And this is just sort of the um, idea of the reduction in, in uh, total wattage, going adding six levels, but going to four using a more efficient light. Um, and I think that was uh, Dan's graphic. Uh, what we did then was just look at the yields, and we basically threw something together to look at uh, what we were doing um, on the uh, per unit section of the MVGS. So. Uh, what we started to look, see was obviously the yields went up because of better lighting, uh, more focus spectrum. Um, we changed the nutrient mix a little bit. We started uh, having our nutrients made for us uh, by a company called Bioplex, which now makes our nutrients on the market. And um, we just basically um, had a saw total increase, which is a little bit higher than that 28%, because these look like they're uh none of the 18 data is in here or 17 data so yeah we've gone up a little bit sort of changed some things so basically we've uh we kept on reducing electricity reducing labor and our yields sort of uh continued to go up and we experiment with different lettuces and uh, some of the smaller head romains we grow in three inch spacing because they have a tendency the way that we grow them to grow uh very upright but most of our spacing is six inches uh, our kale is uh, kale is done on an eight-inch space and is cut and come again to allow for uh, on the second and third cutting. The kale we basically uh, cut probably eight times before we harvest it and replace it with seedlings, so there's a rotation. And again, the MVGS um, systems monocrop the kale 
lettuce, arugula, um, and um, we get pretty good, uh, pretty good production out of that. So really what we're looking at and why we got into the business, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other reasons why other people got into the business, but we were just looking at trying to add some innovation, you know, to the supply chain, be closer to the market. Uh, obviously, vertical farming is very transparent, so you can actually um, trace it back pretty quickly. Um, obviously, from a location that doesn't have a zip code on it, if you're a large farm field, it basically has, you know, a place on the grow floor. You know, our grow floor is about 12,000 square feet. Uh, the other side is really used for, uh, right now it's used for um, some test growing that we're using, but uh, everything seed to sale is done under the roof. So it's seeded, it's grown, it's packaged, and it's shipped from one location. Um, you know, obviously by doing it locally, uh, we provide that community or that region with uh, food sovereignty, meaning that food is uh, there every week. Uh, it's generated in uh, you know, exactly. southwestern Michigan. And uh, you know, we harvest uh, we harvest every week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday are lettuce days. Tuesdays and Thursdays are kale days. Arugula now, we, we plant more arugula. It seems to be a big demand for arugula. We harvest that three days a week. And then basil is, uh, basil seems to be four days a week as well. So um, so we're able to change crops. Uh, and then by adding the Detroit farm over in Detroit, uh, they're able to service the other side of Michigan. Uh, but right now, like I said, they're uh, growing uh, almost exclusively uh, basil. So um, we try to employ people locally. So most of the people that we have that work here um, live within five miles of the farm. Uh, the ecosystem performance, we you know, obviously discharge anything that we would discharge from our nutrients when we swap tanks or do any work. It all goes into a small municipal system uh, that's treated. Um, so really there's no runoff. Uh, you know, we, we run on carbon neutral energy here as well. That's the reason we decided to stay in southwestern Michigan and not go over uh, the border to um, uh, to Indiana and to LaPorte County uh, because they were basically generating most of their electricity uh, on coal basis and it was kind of expensive to buy uh, that energy here. Uh, the energy that we get when we turn on the light switch you know, is carbon neutral. It comes from the Cook Nuclear Power Plant. Um, and that was uh, an early decision we made, but the price was right because we grow mostly on off-peak hours. So our tariff for uh, that by growing off-peak, uh, our electricity cost dips down by about 30% by growing off-peak. So all this stuff you know, changed the way that we were providing local supply versus the local farmers. We don't compete with the local soil farmers. So starting in 2012, these were all the reasons that we decided to you know, look at getting into um, you know, vertical farming. Uh, we added, um, and we'll be adding more uh, to a, a Midwestern uh, distributor called Dutch Farms. They're primarily uh, meat, eggs, bagels, um, and they're right across the street, literally, when I say across the street, from the new Whole Foods Distribution Center, uh, which is also in Pullman. Uh, we have uh, Van Erden distributor, Distribution out of Grand Rapids. Uh, we provide them mostly uh, basil, but uh, they run in and out of Chicago on a regular basis, so they're able to um, stop by get stuff uh, with a truck on a backhaul that's empty um, and like I said before we're basically working on the midway uh, modernization program um, between Detroit and ourselves um, we do twice a week delivery to Whole Foods uh, I think we're doing five or six stores uh, to Whole Foods in southeast Michigan uh, Martin supermarket has about 22 stores throughout South Bend uh, Elkhart uh, and southwestern Michigan Lakeshore was our first, their first uh, uh, early adopter, if you will. So they were um, in basically Northwest Indiana and Southwestern Michigan, and uh, they were they were good feedback because being so close to Chicago, we get a lot of uh, resort folks in the summertime, and uh, we got a lot of information on movement data, uh, preferences. We did some focus group stuff uh, in the stores to kind of define what we were going to sell and, and what sold. Uh, we were starting to deal with uh, fresh time a little bit. Uh, last year, um, and uh, they're nearby. They're about their distribution center is uh, pretty close to us. I mean, probably a little bit over an hour away. Uh, we just haven't had capacity for them yet, which we're gonna uh, in 2019 hopefully start uh, adding a little bit more for uh, the ready-to-eat market. And then basically, right now with the Harvest Moon Farms, um, they're looking at a location um, in Chicago, uh, probably about 35,000 square feet. Um, we're going to try to, you know, work on that and make it more northern location. 
where I knew Buffalo basically services uh, southwestern Michigan, northern Indiana, and uh, a good portion of uh, the southern part and southwest part of the Chicago metropolitan market. So these are decisions that we have to make now because of what we're doing. So when we developed the baseline uh, operational objectives, you know, we knew that scaling was important and scaling takes money. And, um, you know, some of the larger farms realize that, so they have a lot of money to do that. Uh, we sort of were self-funded initially before we went out for outside investment. Um, and again, we kind of focus on the things we do well. Um, we don't do a lot of microgreens, although some customers like us to, they're mostly restaurants. So we'll throw in some microgreens and those are all grown in the nursery. Uh, they're pretty easy to grow. Um, you know, we try, we try to keep the price um, at a reasonable price point, uh, but yet we still have to make money, but we're still priced below organic materials. We don't set the retail price. So what we sell to versus what's sold in the store um, matches sort of a lot of the Earth Bond Olivia organic growth sort of products if it's leafy greens. Um, but really at the end of the day, our schedule is what sort of drives us, um, you know, and you know, everything that we do, uh, we try to have out the door by 2.30 in the afternoon, you know, four days a week. Friday is a little bit longer day if we're doing resupply. And then again, some customers want us to slot into a schedule on a Tuesday um, or a Thursday. Um, so we have to do that. And so really our um, our farm infrastructure as far as cooler space and things like that, we just don't need a lot of it. We have a lot of excess cooler space. Uh, sometimes we actually uh, will store some vegetables for somebody else um, and have them picked up. Uh, we actually are working with some other uh, folks to do some of that work because again, we're, we cut it and it's shipped out usually the same day. In order to do that, you have to focus on you know training and standard operating procedures. Uh, so we have a sort of a mini vertical farm um, instruction class. So when you're hired, there is classroom uh, that you have to go through. It's based on how we do stuff here and in Detroit. Um, the training education is key, is key, but we also want those farm technicians and the people that are harvesting, especially on the cut and come again crops, to know what they're doing and know a little bit about uh, you know plants, uh, not just to harvest it and get into the packaging room. Um, so really. You know, what we do is we sell, you know, wholesale to retail distribution centers now, and uh, we have less uh, direct store delivery, um, but we do add sort of those customers that want to pay for that. And uh, like I said, we probably have about 40% uh, of our um, of our product is direct store delivery. The rest now, again, by Harvest Moon Farms has been handling uh, most of that is through uh, broadliners or through distribution centers. And... Um, you know, part of that is when we have new customers coming in, they sort of knew who Green Spear Farms were. They knew Harvest Moon as a soil farmer. So they had to look at, you know, what our traceability and our food safety programs are. And again, from the beginning, we sort of focused on um, a lot of this, you know, for them. Um, obviously, we, I think we're, I want to say in, a, in January or early February, we have a harmonic gap um, audits uh, plan. But right now, based on the information that we have, we're able to sell them to the market um, based on our uh, existing traceability uh, programs. And um, I think part of that is you know, we focused on that early uh, because we were selling them to the retail market. Um, and it's a little bit different if you come from a soil farm, um, and especially if you're aggregating from other soil farms. So Harvest Moon Farms uh, is, like I said, handling a lot of that. And uh, again, this is a, a slide I'm sure everyone has seen and the advantages of vertical farming. Um, that's what our farm looks like, not today, although we did have a little snow uh, overnight, uh, but this was from last year. And um, you know, we probably spent more time keeping, uh, keeping the parking lot plowed, but that's where we grow our offices are to the left on the second uh, story. Uh, first story is where our nursery are at. And then on the left, um, in the, the, the beige building with the trim, that's the uh, grow floor. And, uh, but that's how we grow. Uh, in Detroit, the building's a little bit smaller. It's probably half the size. Um, and that's what you see inside. And this is an older picture before we uh, started converting more from induction to uh, LED lighting. Um, and again, it's just, uh, again, this is probably 2016 because I can still see tanks on the ground. And we just started working on the, um, um, the MVGS systems. So uh, for, in my opinion, for vertical farming to be success, successful, you know, you need the appropriate scale, but you also need to scale quickly. And uh, I think everybody realizes that now. Um, our rotation for our gourmet mixes are 21 days. So uh, four lettuce mixes make that up here. In Detroit, we grew what was called a Motown mix because 
they seem to like that name. And that was uh, that actually included some Rainbow Shard for a while. Um, and that was uh, Rona's Cut and Come Again. So we sold Rainbow Shard to a couple of large customers. But we were able to then, for the uh, Moton mixes, uh, cut the shard, put it in there, and uh, still grow shard uh, for the other companies that were just, uh, the other customers that were just buying uh, shard. So in 2017, uh, we sort of changed the systems a little bit. They're still a derivative of what we're doing, um, but we've changed some, uh, added some minor automation to it. So we were able to uh, continue to cut back on labor. Um, you know, we're growing some, we're using lighting a little bit differently. Uh, some of the levels right now, we only use a couple of hundred uh, watts of energy to uh, grow some of our cultivars. Um, and again, that's a lot of stuff that we were, um, we were working on to kind of keep on focusing on cost reduction. Um, and some of this stuff um, we've submitted some patent applications on or uh, are pending. Um, and again, what we're doing in Chicago, like I said, we're probably about a 35,000 square foot uh, warehouse building. Um, there's three that we evaluated. And I think depending on what the negotiations are on the business side of it, um, we'll probably be in there sometime in the second quarter uh, starting to plant, but we've been um, testing out all these theories, if you will, uh, full scale every day at, um, um, in uh, our farm in New Buffalo. And then we uh, completed the conversion to 100% LED um, in Detroit uh, first quarter, I think it was like March, end of March uh, 2017. So they've been fully operational with uh, LEDs and they were growing the same thing we were growing here until September when the decision was made to transition and, and have that sort of be the basal farm uh, for what we were uh, doing. And these are just some uh, you know, pictures of some of our um, spirit mix design. Um, and again, it's just different types of lettuces that we use. Um, and again, part of what we're doing is we're looking at where this stuff is coming from. Some of the basil that we're supplanting, if you will, for suppliers uh, that are coming from Colombia. Um, a lot of basil is coming in, a lot of new farts coming in from Hawaii uh, in the bellies of plains. And we just think that, you know, we want to grow something that's local, that's a little fresher, that has less uh, food miles attached to it. Uh, the long distance growing, whether it's, you know, coming from uh, Colombia, um, some of the basil we're, uh, we're displacing is from uh, Peru as well. But uh, we want, we, you know, we believe in fresh and local and we want to basically have less reliance on these international, you know, soil farms because of the risk of, you know, food safety and there. And then again, this is just how some of our product will uh, appear in the grocery store uh, market. It'll be rebranded at some point to Harvest Moon, but that's a five ounce scale. Uh, that's a five ounce spirit mix. Um, that's basically one of our basil leaves. They usually average between three and four inches. Uh, they're sold uh, without any stem. And, um, you know, again, some of these statistics that you see about the drought that occurred, uh, whether it's 2012, 13, 16, uh, the wildfires obviously uh, were an issue. We still are, I guess, in some areas. Um, you know, uh, food waste has become a big issue, and we're pretty proud that we have so little uh, food waste. But again, we're in a growing market, and we're all trying to sort of do the same thing, provide a good product uh, that's nearby, um, and, uh, you know, keep going into that market. A little bit about, you know, who we are. And again, I don't know what happened to Dan. He might have, uh, Dan, Dan's been working on the floor this morning early, but you might have something going on down there that I don't know about. Um, but again, I had an engineering company uh, for about 17 years and started um, doing this as a, um, a test grow um, for a large not-for-profit, uh, not the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but um, and we started uh, looking at lighting, we started looking at energy uses, water. So we really didn't have any preconceived notion of what to do or how to do it. And then in 2011, we decided to separate from uh, my engineering company um, and just finish those projects we had going. Um, I was a sustainability consultant for Coca-Cola uh, for their emerging brands. So some of this stuff hit close to home because a lot of the work that I did for them were uh, overseas, uh, South America, and I saw sort of a lot of the agricultural uh, aspects of what they were doing uh, there. Um, I worked in Antarctica, which was a, a poster child for being able to grow fresh and local uh, with less electricity. Um, kind of an interesting uh, concept. There are some things growing down there. And um, as far as I know, we were the first vertical farm to grow stevia indoors for Coca-Cola. Um, and we did it for a couple of years. We did different types of plants. We did some cloning. 
Um, and that's when they were trying to look at, you know, the sugar content, what they were going to put in, how they were going to use it. And that was a very interesting uh, period of time because, um, you know, it allows us to then still, I don't work with Coca-Cola anymore. Uh, that contract, uh, once I started doing vertical farming, I just had to kind of phase out of it. Um, the last thing we did for them was the, uh, uh, the grow for the 2012 Olympic Games and then a little bit of work um, down in Atlanta market. So my son Dan sort of does a lot of the research and development, you know, stuff. He um, doesn't have a real background in growing things, but he just has a knack for figuring things out. So he does a lot of our lighting plans, um, you know, stuff that he grows. He tries to do it uh, better, quicker, faster, less electricity. Um, kind of, kind of has some interesting things going on. And I've gotten more working with a couple of design teams, and we've done some feasibility studies across the. United States recently, uh, mostly for private investor groups, uh, looking at trying to think about whether or not that West Coast supply could be supplemented by, you know, stuff that's going to be essentially uh, east of the Mississippi. Um, and we are doing some lighting and technical advisory in Colorado and Michigan. That's a different crop, um, different type of cultivar. Um, you know, so um, we've added some expertise there. Um, one of our other uh, original, he's not a founder, but Steve Taylor was. Uh, in it from the beginning. Steve runs a lot of our numbers. He's developed sort of a, a cloud-based traceability, you know, program that we've used. Uh, he's now uh, kind of taken that to uh, blockchain sort of uh, traceability. Um, and he's, you know, working on that and introducing some different things onto, uh, to us. Um, and then Jeff Foote, uh, obviously a former Coca-Cola executive. Uh, he works now with uh, sustainability and Jeff helps us a little bit on uh, doing some evaluations on us. Uh, as far as you know, our statistics and what we're doing. So, um, like Kerry said, we're one of the oldest. So we we know we were the first vertical farm, commercial vertical farm, um, when we started um, in 2012. Um, and then basically, uh, a lot of the work that we did in 2012 while we were building out Green Spirit Farm was funded pretty much by my engineering company. And then um, we started doing that. And then we got uh, approached by Life Kitchens. In 2013, added capacity there, and then, like I said before, uh, we did the Olympics, and then um, we ended up expanding in Detroit based on an investor group that thought uh, they should be growing, you know, stuff more locally. Um, and the Detroit experience has been really, um, uh, really fulfilling because we hire people from the neighborhood. We're not in the suburbs; we're in uh, the community of Brightmore. It is, it is in the neighborhood, as the local uh, folks say, um, and. Um, you know, we participate uh, a lot in things that happen at the Eastern Market uh, as a supplier, but really, um, right now, like I said, we switched to mostly basil. And again, for us to work, you know, we have an advantage over the West Coast and the international stuff because we're in the market. Um, we enjoy a little bit uh, higher retail pricing. Some of that we can uh, command, some of it is just uh, the retail operations are able to sell our stuff at a higher price point since, um, you know, we deliver to them. Uh, we actually have, um, you know, vertical farms require uh, probably less capex for the same type of uh, yield, um, you know, on what we're doing because, like I said, here in, the, in our experience here in Michigan, Michigan um, the farm in Detroit was vacant for probably four or five years. Um, and basically, since we have self-contained growing systems, we put in the racks, we bought the lights, we were growing in Detroit in 120 days. Uh, this facility here is about 20,000 square feet in New Buffalo. And uh, when we came in here, we uh, sort of power wash, painted, uh, did some stuff, and started growing. Our first harvest was 90 days later. And uh, really sort of we rent buildings rather than own them, uh, so there wasn't no special construction. We had to put in some, uh, you know, air movement uh, material or, or equipment. Um, but again, part of it was, you know, looking at growing cut and come again crops. Um, and trying to grow some, you know, herbs that we can make money on reliably. Um, and really our customers then uh, our different segments sort of dictate what we end up growing. So vertical farming, you know, obviously we can move in about 60 days to a new crop, uh, grow that crop for six months, a year. Uh, kale seems to still be very strong. I'm waiting for something to uh, displace kale. I don't know what it's going to be, but I can't believe how much kale that we uh, grow and sell. Uh, our lettuces are, you know, our I sell well. Uh, the arugula, the last uh, eight to nine, ten months, uh, seems to be a lot more demand for arugula, so we've planted a lot more of that. Um, 
this is a, a graphic I put together um, quite a ways back, maybe several years ago, looking at what the uh, what the water usage was at that time. Uh, this is pre-drought uh, in California, and it was based on uh, you know sourcing the information on you know how to grow lettuce outside. Um, and again, we just use a lot less water. So that water is better available for those crops that you can sell regionally. So rather than export water in the form of lettuce and leafy greens from California, this might be a better way of doing that. But you know that's you know that's someone else's business model, not mine. So um, you know this is basically you know our kale, and we harvest uh, a bunch of kale weekly. Um, and like I said, we do seven or eight times uh, cutting of kale. It's cut and come again. Um, again, this is an old image because uh, the tanks are still underneath the ground. Uh, but we have about four to five uh, in spacing. These are the old four level systems. Um, you know, we switched to the new single level, or the six level single, uh, six system systems. And uh, these are how we plant arugula. So you see our arugula is basically three in spacing. Uh, it's multi seeded. And in about uh, 12 days, that's what we get. And then we cut that probably five to six times. Uh, and then we replant it. Um, we sell arugula in, in two ounce packages. Um, our basil, again, sold as a stem only in one ounce or uh, half ounce packaging. Um, this is some of the work we've done on strawberries. And, um, you know, we've had some pretty good luck with strawberries. And uh, Dan, my son Dan, um, who probably is not going to make it today, Cherry, unfortunately, that he, um, he basically has had some uh, success and been working with some West Coast strawberry um, growers. Uh, to put together uh, some different varieties and um, we grow more of a Michigan strawberry a little smaller but a very high bricks content um, and we don't sell those commercially yet but one of the things we're going to do in Chicago is work on more of a developing a strawberry patch which is what we were doing um, in Pennsylvania in Pennsylvania our goal was to have uh, when we were doing that demonstration farm in 13 and 14 uh, was to have more of a, a strawberry focus but you need uh, need to need to come up with a system that works relatively well, and I think Dan, uh, from a harvesting standpoint and uh, berry selection, works you know pretty well. Again, this is a graphic I'm sure a lot of people have seen, but at the end of the day, um, I think vertical farming can go to those places and not only grow just leafy greens, but clearly with the different type of um, you know farm-based systems you can have, uh, we can grow green feed for animals, and that goes into protein. So I think part of this moving away from, you know, just growing uh, leafy greens or other cultivars, uh, we can start growing feed for people. And we actually did a, um, a longer term test for that uh, from a group from the Middle East. We grew it here uh, at the farm uh, to grow uh, alfalfa. Um, and um, it, was, uh, it was pretty interesting. I think the, um, the results are that uh, you can do it. Um, and if you're in a location where you have to import a lot of your feed for your animals, um, green feed has a lot of advantage over uh, dry feed, but it's just a transportation cost of getting the alfalfa hay from you know the Midwest uh, to the Middle East. So that was um, that was sort of interesting. That was done on a contract basis. We were asked to do that, and uh, we sort of gave them information of what we knew about uh, growing alfalfa in, you know in our systems or modified uh, systems. So basically, at the end of the day, we try to eliminate the weather risk. Uh, we're growing inside, so we grow year-round, uh, and we grow local. But if it doesn't taste good and you can't sell it, it doesn't really you know, matter. So I think this slide from, uh, uh, from our perspective show where we, uh, where we started uh, with some uh, early innovators uh, in 2011 and 12, and then we had those early adopters. And then we sort of now have that you know, early majority, late majority, where uh, we're growing, um, we're selling more than we can grow. And I think the combination of the experience that the soil farmers had, Harvest Moon Farms, you're looking how, in their opinion, how much easier it is to do <laughs> vertical farming than soil farming. I tend to agree with them, uh, but it's really just about better risk management. It still requires continual improvement. You're still, it's still farming. Uh, everybody who runs a vertical farm or participates in vertical farming knows that there's a lot of moving parts that have to get done, and at the end of the day, you still got to grow it, you still got to package it, you still got to sell it, and you got to do it every day um, at scale to be successful. And um, we're doing. Um, I My thought last? we have to. Yeah. Um, I I hate to stop, but um, we I am. want to have yeah. Yeah, I mean, so this is where we're Back at. Up. Thank you. Uh, I just really wanted to mention Puerto Rico. 
So we have uh, a, a containerized unit that's, a, uh, that's here in New Buffalo uh, that was delivered to us by some folks that make those kind of things. Uh, we've added our expertise in, uh, inside of that. We, so we have a 40-foot uh, container that we're test growing some Puerto Rican crops. Uh, you know, Dan's working, I think that's what Dan's working on right now, probably. Uh, Dan's working on uh, putting the lighting to that. And uh, we were just got back from Puerto Rico last week. And we don't know how many of those units that will ship down there, but we're going to be coming up with the standard operating procedures for that, looking at how the Puerto Rican crops grow versus our crops. And uh, that will probably um, occur for the next quarter. Um, but that's something that we never thought we would be doing. But since we had some space, that's why we don't have the other um, vertical farm going on the other side of our spot because it's being occupied now by uh, a containerized growing unit. All right. So well, thank you so much, Maya. It was a lot of information. Very, very <laughs> inspiring.